Morning. Um, I'm Megan Blakely and I am going to start off the program today with talking about intangible cultural heritage and intellectual property. And since we are in this gallery setting, I wanted to focus on the glam sector and we are starting our morning with a pun. So glamorizing intangible cultural heritage. So my assigned posts, the way we're going to proceed this morning, are starting a little bit with definitions and challenges. The law sort of functions on def defining and making boundaries. And intangible cultural heritage, by its nature, needs to expand, to be living, to evolve, and to reflect the identity of the practicing community. Uh, so that will be the first thing that I will start to take a look at. And then I will talk a little bit about the process that happens when intangible cultural heritage changes form in order to be propertized as it does with intellectual property where there become exclusionary ownership limits on um, this type of heritage. And look at a few case studies in the UK. I focus specifically on Celtic derived culture, just first of all to get some sort of focus on um, what I'm looking at. But then also, uh, since uh, developed countries, Ireland, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, all sort of are more focused on intellectual property development legally um, and get less focus in cultural policy which seems to be changing though. And talk a little bit about that as well. And then um, just a few concluding thoughts about what this means for glam. So, culture producing versus knowledge produce producing. We are divided sort of with the global north and south. The global north seems to be more focused on knowledge producing in the law. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list of the international instruments that um, have been put into place in the fields of intellectual property and culture, but it is meant to track chronologically a little bit how these two legal systems have developed independently of each other. Uh, so even from 1886 with the Berne Convention for Artistic and Literary Works, um, you have the Hague Convention for Cultural Property, and they sort of develop in two different streams and don't cross over very much as far as inter international instruments go. Um, so the main convention that works with intangible cultural heritage uh, was put together in 2003, came into force in 2006, the Convention for Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage. And you'll notice that there was an intentional word choice here with this convention for using safeguarding as opposed to the language that you see with the Berne Convention that's protection, the World Heritage Convention which focused on um, monuments or non-movable heritage uh, such as landmarks or symphony theaters, these sorts of things, use the terminology protecting and preserving and trips which is the strongest intellectual property um, convention, also uses the terminology protecting. So there is literature about how safeguarding was um, meant to reflect the different nature of what the convention was addressing. So. Uh, since we probably have people here from a law background and also from a culture background, I'll try to touch just a little bit on the definitions of each. Uh, so intangible cultural heritage, uh, this is a little dark, is defined by the convention as the practices, representations, expresses, expressions, knowledge, skills of communities, groups, including the objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces. Um, that individuals recognize as a part of their cultural heritage. Um, and it also provides a sense of community and identity. So if any of you are lawyers, you see how this might be problematic if you were trying to write some sort of statute or law surrounding this because it's very vague uh, to really point out what this might be. They also provide some illustrations of what this might look like, which might be oral traditions and expressions, performing arts, um, craftsmanship, and all these sorts of things that you can see how it might cross over into artistic and literary works, and some of it doesn't. Uh, so the protection could overlap. If you do join the 2003 convention on safeguarding intangible cultural heritage, 
Your obligations will be listing and indexing ICH, uh, promoting awareness and education about intangible cultural heritage, and um, international participation. I was recently at a conference on the 10 year anniversary of this um, being in force and it seems the countries that are not signed on to the convention or feel very strongly that they should and the countries that have signed on to the convention feel that perhaps the definition isn't sufficient to meet um, all of the types of intangible cultural heritage that they practice but they all agreed that it was important to be at the table and have the conversation and to be a part of the international um, input about this type of heritage. As I mentioned, I'd focused on Celtic-derived countries, and notably the United States, the UK, and I did used to have Ireland on here as not being signed on. It has now signed on to the convention. So what they're one of the newest joiners, one of the newest parties to the convention. Um, and I'll talk about a few examples from each of these jurisdictions and why it might make a difference if they were involved. As far as um, joining or not joining, uh, for the UK specifically, some of the uh, criticisms have been that it could be construed real, too narrowly or too broadly of protections, could create another just exclusionary listing and not really reflect, um, it might turn into the same thing as what we already have, protections that are just listed and there's no real effect on the culture, so there would be no reason to sign on. Um, and also the ossific ossification and stagnation, um, which you'll read a little bit about intangible cultural heritage, because it is something that is a living um, reflection of identity. And if you list it, then you limit the protection to that current manifestation. So these are just some of the criticisms about the convention or reasons to not ratify. Um, and you see here there was a study done of English uh, UK heritage practitioners from English heritage actually um, by Smith and Watterson and when they were talking about why they didn't think that it was a good idea to ratify the convention they said it is just difficult to see how you could apply a convention of that sort in the UK context it's not relevant it does not fit with the UK approach I think it would be very difficult to bring in a convention that says we are actually going to list this sort of stuff and protect it. What obvious examples could you come up with? Morris dancing as intangible heritage and so on. The UK has no intangible heritage, right? So this is um, a big impetus for why I started looking at some of these examples because even some heritage practitioners have said that they don't think that um, the UK has any intangible cultural heritage. The conventions that they are signed on to, though, are the trade-related aspects of intellectual property. So anything that has to do with knowledge protection, um, economic exploitation, um, is signed on to. And the intellectual property in the UK, as many of you know, is protected under the CDPA. And generally what you need for intellectual property protection and copyright is to have an original, fixed, artistic, or literary work um, that will be granted exclusion, exclusionary property rights for a limited time, and this goes to the creator. And these rights are to make, sell, use, uh, reproduce, derive, perform. This is not statutory um, comprehensively. This is meant to be a survey of the general rights that you might get um, when you get copyright protection. And um, there are exceptions and limitations to this, and there's also uses that are fair under different uh, situations such as parity or um, research. So how do these two things relate together? Uh, a lot of the time in countries that have strong IP regimes, if you are a creator or an author, um, you might be encouraged to transform the shape of your uh, work to fit IP protection, to best um, protect your work either from other people exploiting it or protect your own rights to exploit your work the way that you want. Um, and so you might be encouraged to take something that is only an oral story and write it down for that protection. So when you when what we've talked about so far with intangible cultural heritage, you can see how that overlaps to artistic and literary works. And so it's copyrightable, right? So some of this, if you change the form, and this happens a lot in sort of um, when you're doing library work or archives or museums, in order to display and convey the intangible cultural heritage, you might have this in a form of something that's recorded, which then might gain a copyright protection, or something that is an oral history that is recorded and written down. So these sorts of, um, 
changes in form to ICH can happen with the uh, glam sector, and particularly with technological advancement um, and the globalization that happens along with the reach. So all of these works here that were digitized are a part of this phenomenon. You don't have to go to these museums or these uh, libraries to see these works. Um, so that will increase sort of the amount of uh, works that will go through a change in form or pieces of ICH that will change form as they reach wider audiences through technological means. Um, so particularly with intangible cultural heritage, there is something that has to happen to it in order for this to occur. It's different if you're dealing with um, something that is already written down, a book, it doesn't change form, it's written. But if you're dealing with a cultural practice or a part of craftsmanship, it needs to go through a tangification process. There has to be something to make it tangible so the law can protect it. Um, so if you have ICH and you look back at this definition, um, that is from the convention that says that it's transmitted from generation to generation, constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment. If you make that tangible, it has to be fixed in a certain form in order to be property. Um, and this is a necessary but not sufficient chain, right? Some of these things happen and stop there. It might go into a tangible form and not be eligible for copyright and thereby not be property. But in order to be um, property, it has to move into a tangible form. Once it's property, there's the possibility that it uh, can be commodified, which would just mean in a form that it can be sold. Um, and once it's in a form that it can be sold, there's always the danger that these things get very popular, you get generic knockoffs, and then you start to sort of lose the identity that's associated with the ICH. Um, and for glam sector institutions, you're probably, intellectual property is probably operating up here with, with where it goes into a tangible form to be property, but when you're working in the glam sector, you're probably working down here. How, do you um, make something accessible to people in a tangible form without it losing its cultural identity, right? So this is where the commodification to the commoditization, once it becomes a commodity, it's anything like a generic pair of sunglasses or um, you know, anything, any product that you would buy, tape, it's just something that you wouldn't associate with cultural identity. But there is this uh, process that can go through. So, um, some of the examples I'm going to talk about uh, include Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, uh, just to sort of rebut the point a little bit, but yes, there is lots of intangible cultural heritage in the UK and in Ireland. Um, so tartan is ICH. You'll see here that um, many of you are probably familiar with this in this area, right? But tartan was banned by the Dress Act and um, as a way of social integration was put back into the Highlands and put to the clans and said sort of, you know, can you please send us to London, your clan tartan? And the clan chiefs said, well, we don't really have one, but pick us a good one and we're happy to, you know, be a part of this. So it was a way to sort of reintegrate um, people through uh, craftsmanship and through tradition and through community identity, that's how the clan assignments happen. This is actually a postcard from 1920, which was the first commercial use of um, uh, tartan. And this is the uh, controversial, I would say, Commonwealth Games tartan for Scotland. So it's been readopted, but very much in a, in aware, with awareness that it's sort of a second way of adoption and a, a readoption of cultural identity. Um, we actually do have a Create Tartan, just to see um, as the clan registration was moved in 2009 to the NRS. So there is also um, social activities and cultural worth sort of that goes along with managing these sorts of things. So it'll be interesting to see over the next few years what happens with the centralized government registration of clans where, or of Tartan, whereas the clans used to do this as a function, a social function. Wales, Estedfod, we probably um, are also familiar with this. Um, but Whale Welsh as a language was banned in, um, in the country um, as a way to integrate into England, of course, and it was taken out of the um, public discourse. You could not uh, use that as a language. Um, it was banned in public administration and courts. And not until 1967 was there the Welsh Language Act 
that um, assigned equal validity, which just meant that it's not illegal anymore, but it was not until 1993 you got equal treatment. And a lot of this change was spurred through social movements, through intangible cultural heritage practices at the things like language festivals. This is in the 1940s. This is one of the, the first sort of renewed estifades, and this is a more recent picture. And a lot of this was also done by sort of guerrilla relabel relabeling of signs. Um, people would go out in the 60s and go out, change the change the street signs, right? So it was a little bit of like sheer cultural force, right, to make these statutory changes. Ireland um, put on a fairly well financed in 2013 effort for the gathering, which uh, was again controversial. Um, some people were quite enthused about it. It had a large amount of social participation. Uh, but it did create a brand uh, of what it means to be Irish, and they would uh, give money to people that could demonstrate that they brought relatives over during the year 2013 to participate in the gathering who otherwise would not have uh, visited. This in the middle is a postcard that was handed out to school children so that they could write to invite the people that left, which um, is problematic in a way because many people had to leave Ireland because of the, the social and economic situation there. So now they're invited back. Um, so people like, well, former now Ambassador Gabrielle Byrne was not pleased. Uh, the grabbing was also called by the Ryanair CEO. Um, so this is when tourism promotion becomes cultural branding, right? So when, where is the line on that? Um, and for the law, um, there actually is, um, this is the chart that has your minimum number of visitors that you can prove either by photograph or boarding passes and providing this data to the government, and they'll pay you 500 euro if you have a minimum number of overseas visitors. And this is to things like um, your family gathering uh, or the gathering of Pipers who are from the south of Cork or something, you know. So anything that was already happening, you could plug into this formula, brand it with the gathering branding, and get money back for providing this data that you had people come. And on intellectual property, the first clause looks fairly uh, typical, but in the submissions, they go ahead and claim that um, any IP that is submitted, and they requested photos and all these sorts of things, would become property of the company of free disposal and use of the company um, unless otherwise specified in writing. All materials um, will be public and the ownership um, to present and future existing rights and information without compensation uh, will belong to the company. So there is this small print. And there's nothing nefarious going on right now, I suppose, right? But then you have this legal precedent, this trend that you make these records of cultural happenings that are already occurring and can compensate for that um, and also claim intellectual property rights in that. Um, just my present example, which I've barely uh, started to explore and I just saw in the news and I know there are people in the room that are at least familiar if are not participating with this project. Um, so it's the 40th anniversary of a punk culture celebration in London and there are many, many sponsors. And in the Financial Times and also by some of the members that um, are close to the movement or the bands, uh, have called it things like tourism or a tribute band, um, whereas there's lots of enthusiastic, enthusiastic participation as well. Uh, so this is one example of something that has a lot of ICH attached to it, um, where people have very different um, perspectives on how it should be handled. The son of the late manager has gone public and has said that um, in November he will burn five million pounds of memorabilia related to um, punk scene. Uh, so not everyone is pleased, but this is still um, in progress. And also a question about cultural heritage. Does it belong to the practicing community or does it belong to sort of the common heritage of mankind or humankind? Um, and if we take the position that it belongs to everyone, then perhaps this is the right way to go, that we have an anniversary, we celebrate it in different ways. Um, if it belongs to the practicing community and it no longer has that value to the community, or if one of those values is anti-institutionalism, is it the right thing to institutionalize it? 
Um, so I'll just leave that as an open question that um, will hopefully provoke some discussion. Um, my concluding thoughts about this, um, I don't know that a circle is really the right way to put this, but I wanted to convey an interaction between um, legal reward and reinforcement. So when you have heavy intellectual property regi regimes, that's going to create an authorized heritage discourse, as uh, Laura Jane Smith called it. Um, and sort of sanction and encourage the types of output, cultural output, that will fit into intellectual property, right? Um, and so if we don't examine this process and we don't acknowledge the intellectual property and intangible cultural heritage um, that is inherent in sort of the glam sector practices as keepers of cultural heritage, um, there's always the danger that you lose some of this ICH um, just without, in, in the face of documenting. Um, and also there's just sort of a general, general overvaluation of tangible expression as documented sort of as the uh, conventions that have been put forth in culture from the World Heritage Convention. The 2003 convention is really one of the first to address ICH. Um, so this is just sort of the symbiotic relationship that I'm looking at in my work. So thank you.